Welcome back. This is the second session of the substantive review of constitutional law. And we're gonna go into some pointers from my CRAM guide. And the CRAM guide is answers and explanations that I've taken from individual questions and teased out as what we should learn. So it's a little bit hard to read because I can't zoom in right now, but hopefully some of my um, people in the room with 2020 vision can help me out. I'll read the first slide and, and we'll talk about this. Matt, interrupt at any point, anyone interrupt at any point if they see something that is interesting. You know me, I'll interrupt myself. Parties who seek to defend gender-based government action must demonstrate an exceedingly persuasive justification for that action. So gender-based action, and they're trying to defend it, we're talking about an intermediate scrutiny level. And when we're talking about gender-based discrimination, remember that it has to be targeting the gender. It can't just be the effect of it. So if there's a rule that a school, a public school, requires that you have to have shorts that go below your knees and all the women are affected by it, that's not intermediate scrutiny because the rule was not targeting women, it just had the effect on women. So it has to be uh, aimed at women. The supremacy clause of the United States Constitution declares the supremacy of federal laws over state laws that contradict them. We talked Mama, about I work it. preemption Mama. and uh, how the federal law is going to preempt the state law. The 11th Amendment and the state sovereignty that it embodies are limited by the provisions of the 14th Amendment, which grants Congress authority to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of the 14th Amendment, which themselves are significant limitations on state authority. Okay, so we talked about 11th Amendment, that being state sovereignty, but that it's limited by the provisions of the 14th Amendment, which grant Congress the authority to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of the 14th Amendment, which themselves are significant limitations on state authority. So the 11th Amendment can't uh, contradict the 14th Amendment. That's kind of a rare thing to see, but it's something that we certainly tease from a tough question. The rational basis test is used to review laws and statutes that do not directly impact the suspect class and do not directly burden a fundamental right. While the right to work is fundamental, the right to work at a given place as a government or state employee is not considered a fundamental right. Those with a history of drug problems would not be given special status or recognized as a potential group. Uh, Amy, you have a question, go ahead. Yes, um, regarding the 11th Amendment and that it's limited by the provisions of the 14th Amendment, uh, does can you elaborate a little bit on, um, more on that? Like um, what does that mean, actually mean? Is it like if it's a state has a law regarding... Um, so, yeah, it's that state can't claim, and, and you'd have to see the specifics of this question, but that a state can't claim state sovereignty in a way that impedes on the equal protection of its citizens. So it can't say just because we're um, a state and we're immune, we can enforce legislation that impedes on the 14th Amendment rights. So it's kind of like a hierarchy in that the 14th Amendment will trump the 11th Amendment in a conflict. But again, I don't want you to get confused on that because that is, could, could be confusing. This one and the second one we did, do we understand that that could be tough? The right to work is fundamental, but the right to work at a given place is not considered fundamental. So in this fact pattern, it would have been someone with a drug problem that was um, you know, more or less fired from their job. And that would have been given a rational basis review. Even though it was about work, it was just about where they were working. All right, and then this last one. Social and economic regulation is generally subject to rational basis review, and then therefore for a presumption of validity. So uh, again, social and economic regulation is not a suspect class. It's not a fundamental right. It would be a rational basis review. You can see just from these pointers that a lot of the questions come down to level of scrutiny. All right, um, let's try the next slide. Uh, Lisa, you said you have good eyes, or at least you have glasses on. You think you could read this one? Um, yes, a government's interest in preventing the evils associated with puppy mills, including inhumane treatment of animals and overpopulation, are plainly legitimate ends of government. Again, that's just a specific example that 
the government's interest in preventing the evils with pup, puppy mills is legitimate ends of government. So if you see that question where they're doing something to stop that, that's legitimate. It's straight from a case. You know, a lot of this stuff here is going to come straight from a case. All right, can you read the next one, Lisa? Under rational basis review, a law requires only some reasonably conceivable between the tech challenged laws and the government's legitimate ends. Right. And so that's just an understanding and reinforcement of rational basis review that just needs to be legitimate and rationally related. Um, you kind of froze up on us a little bit. Uh, Amy, uh, no worries. Do you mind reading this next one about federal deck? Yeah, federal uh, declaratory relief may be allowed when no state prosecution is pending and a federal plaintiff shows a genuine threat of enforcement of a disputed state criminal statute. Okay. I mean, this one kind of has some civil procedure elements related to it, but it's talking about declaratory relief, where if there's a genuine threat that um, the enforcement of a statute will uh, cause you irreparable harm or something of that nature, then federal declaratory relief may be allowed. Again, you see how these con law questions are tough and there's just little pointers that we can take. Um, Let's see this next one. Government actions that infringe upon a fundamental right will generally receive strict scrutiny. Other claims receive rational basis. Rational basis requires the laws rationally related to legitimate state interests. It is today settled that the right of a person to have a certain look or way of dress elicits concept of a fundamental liberty. Sorry. So they can't um, they can't uh, impose on how a person can look or dress. That's fundamental. But again, if it's in a public school and it's for a certain reason, then maybe it could be. But just in general, you know, they the state can't impose that people have a way of looking or dressing. If they impose that all people in the state have to cut their hair a certain way, that would be super messed up. Um, a person's membership in a subversive organization is not an endorsement of criminal activities, right? We can, not we can all, but... People can be in subversive groups, and that doesn't mean that there, there's something wrong with that, right? There's literally politicians who are in the KKK, right? Just because you're in that group doesn't mean that you're like a criminal, unless you contribute to that criminal activity. Um, all right, Cram it to me, Matt, you wanna read uh, this page for us? Can you see these? It's hard. Yeah, I can. <clears throat> Uh, privileges, licenses, certificates, and franchises qualify as property interests for purposes of procedural due process. So basically anything, like before an interest was like a certain kind of thing, but now like literally almost anything can be a property in it, interest. Like if you have a job, like your job could be a property interest or um, like a law degree is a property interest, like anything can be a property interest these days. Uh, the 14th Amendment guarantees due process of law before the government can deprive an individual of life, liberty, or property and prevents a state from enforcing, facilitating, encouraging, or authorizing such private discrimination. It also guarantees equal protections of law. So yeah, as we talked about before, or as Andrew talked about before, um, there's such a thing as a state action doctrine that only state actions, state actions are accountable under the Constitution, but if a private action is like so intertwined with a state action, as in like, a, you know, the police paying an informant to break into someone's home or something of that nature, then that also counts under state action doctrine so that the constitution applies to that. And you have equal protection clause, which requires a state to have a legitimate reason for withdrawing a right or benefit from, from one group, but not others, whether it was required to confer that right or benefit or not in the first place. So this only really matters in terms of special classes. For example, if the government says, um, you know, passes a law about people who use solar panels versus people who don't, that's technically, you know, treating groups differently, but that's still a rational basis. Only when it's a suspect class does it trigger like higher scrutiny. A public official may not refuse to permit the dissemination of a message in a public forum solely on the basis of its content unless that denial is necessary to, 
to serve a compelling government interest that's strict scrutiny. So yeah, a content-based discrimination or viewpoint-based discrimination is not allowed in public forum. Threat of violence are not protected speech. Yeah, threats are not allowed, regardless of whether there's an overt act or not. Yeah, threat alone is enough to not be protected. A neighbor who spray paints racial epithets and threats on a house can be convicted under a law that criminalizes threats with intent to make one fear for their life. Yeah, the only issue is that the laws can't be overbroad or vague, which is also an important thing. I don't know if that's later on the crim guide, but you can't pass a law saying a person cannot make any message to another person that you know offends them or makes them afraid because that's overbroad because there's some things that you can say that offends a person that's still free speech but then there's other things that like threats or fighting words or obscenity that's not protected so that's, laws can't be overbroad that's the benefit of having you in here i should have put that in my in my powerpoint honestly vagueness and overbreath i focus on it heavily on essays but it's also something that comes up on on mbe is yeah. vagueness and overbreath vagueness what is the law punishing like loitering and then overbreath it's punishing too much it's punishing legal uh, activity or speech as well as unlawful speech. So really good stuff, man. I, you're natural at this, at reading the, the rule of law and then explaining it. I like that. Um, all right, Pablo, I haven't heard too much from you. Can you read this? Can you read this? The disparate impact of law on women. I'll read the first one because I already talked about it. The disparate impact of law on women without more does not constitute sex discrimination and thus is insufficient by itself to trigger heightened judicial scrutiny of the law's constitutionality. In order for an ordinance to be considered discriminatory against women, a court must find that the city adopted the ordinance because it would have a disparate impact on women. That's literally exactly what I talked about. And a lot of things I talked about are because I reviewed these cram guys. Like if it's the shorts to go below your knees, then it's not uh, on itself, on its face, uh, a disparate impact on women. It has to be um, because it would have a disparate impact on women. Um, let's see, there's a new message. Do you hear me? No, Pablo, we don't hear you at all. Um, Alita, what were you saying? Oh, no. That was, a, that was an earlier message that I typed but never sent. But then I was responding to Pablo with an L and it just went together. Do you mind reading this next one, Alita? Um, sure. Uh, if an ordinance is a con content neutral restriction of expression, it must satisfy intermediate scrutiny, which requires the city to prove that the ordinance is narrowly tailored to further an important government interest and that it leaves open alternative, alternative channels of communication. Right, that's a tough one for people to get right on the test because it's the First Amendment and it's the time, place, and manner. Yes, it's content neutral, but now it's going to be some intermediate scrutiny because it's a public forum, right? We talked about if it was a non-public forum, then it would be an even lower level. But here, it's a content neutral, time, place, and manner. Um, do you mind reading the next three? Uh, sure. Sure. The tax clause of Article 1, Section 8 gives Congress plenary power, power to raise revenue through taxes. Anything to say? I mean, we just see that on the exam. That's a common answer. Like, sure, they can do it. That's plenary power. If it's just to raise revenue, taxing or spending, not to necessarily pass laws, but to tax or spend. Sure. The Commerce Clause of Article 1 empowers Congress to regulate economic or commercial activity that, in the aggregate, has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. The sale of controlled substances is a commercial activity. My experience is when I'm totally lost on a question, Commerce Clause is a safe harbor answer. I feel like a lot of times it is the Commerce Clause that will enable them to regulate. So definitely want to make sure we understand the Commerce Clause. And that was just what I was talking about, the marijuana in the closet. Commerce Clause. And this last one? Any permanent physical occupation by the government of private property is a taking for which just compensation to the property owner is required. Certainly, we talked about that. Um, Pablo, did your mic turn back on? Yeah, do you hear me now or no? Perfect, I can hear you now, like the old Verizon commercial. Um, do you okay. mind reading some of these pieces? Okay. Um, do you hear me, right? 
Are you loud and clear? Yes. Privilege and immunity clause applies only to individual, no corporation. Right. We talked about that. And mm -hmm. privilege and immunities is about out of staters and that type of discrimination, but only individuals, not corporations. Okay. Okay. The highly exclusivity for discrimination of women is only targeted if there is a discriminatory purpose, not just a discriminatory effect. For the third time, we reinforce that. And the next one? A state, dur oh, no. a state dur duration of requirement must meet a strict scrutiny. For example, recruiting or barber to have been a resident of the state in two years to receive license is unconstitutional. Right. That's, you know, there's some questions where maybe we could talk about differences, but on its face, durational requirements or strict scrutiny. Requiring a barber to have been a resident for two years to receive a license unconstitutional. Good. And the next one, the next three? Yes. A, a bill of attainder is a law that throws someone in jail without a hearing of trial. Mm -hmm. The impairment of the contract clause prohibited the state from enacting legislation of impure existing contracts. Definitely. And the last one, exposed facts, exposed facts laws are unconstitutional, unconstitutional because they punish behavior retroactively that was not punishable at the time. Perfect. And then the last slide from this PowerPoint, you can't answer this if you were here yesterday. Does anyone know who this is? John Adams. Nice, who said that? Claudio. Wait, you were here yesterday. Oh, you said I wasn't here? Oh. Yeah. I didn't hear you. It's all right. Well, would anyone have known that if they weren't here? Uh, my brain was saying something, Adams, but maybe I'm off, so I will not make a joke of myself. But I always, I have, I always put up talk about John Adams to prove a point. One that everyone's full of themselves, no one knows anything, because people claim to be the smartest people of all time and have all these degrees. That's the number one question you can ask them to make them to humble them. Who is the second? Pre first, ask them who is the first president. Oh, George Washington, and say, okay, who is the second? They're stumped. No one knows John Adams, and I like John Adams and his son, John Quincy Adams. They were the only two of the first 10 presidents who didn't own slaves. They were repulsed by the idea of slavery. So it's like, you know, just because everyone else is doing something doesn't mean you have to do it. Not that I'm saying he's a great guy. He looks kind of not like my best friend, but at least he didn't partake in one of the great atrocities of our time. But anyway, um, I want to actually go into this while we have the... Um, master of service here because i think this is really um this is really something that is helpful and applicable um so grace while i have you what is standing and why is it important um standing is the being able to um <laughs> to stool right and it's uh Injury, in fact, something like that. ¿Qué más? Dos más. Injury, in fact, y... I don't remember. <laughs> Injury, causation, and... Don't put me in this spot. Yeah, no, that's what class is all about. Injury, redressability. Injury, causation, redressability. Yeah. And then, perfect. Um, can anyone, so I don't feel bad, Tell me what the political question doctrine is. Well, that the, that the Supreme Court cannot answer political questions. <laughs> Beautiful. And ooh. yeah, but I mean, like, the main thing is like, what what constitutes a political question? What does constitute a political question? Yeah, which are things that are generally reserved for the other branches. Like, I think there is one case about how to conduct an impeachment trial. Uh, Supreme Court said, according to the Constitution, that's something that Congress has to do. We can't say that they conducted it wrong, or usually anything to do with like foreign affairs generally is a political question or like war. They try to stay away from that. But anything yeah. having to do with the statute and how to interpret a statute is almost never a political question. Nice. Um, what about an advisory opinion? Do you want to stay on the microphone, Matt? Yeah. So. You can, so the Supreme Court, some, I think the Florida Supreme Court can actually do advisory opinions, but the federal Supreme Court and a lot of state Supreme Courts cannot do advisory opinions, which are just uh, 
you know, opinions on what the law is without any underlying case. So if you take like Brown v. Board of Ed, like the holding was that you can't segregate in public schools, but the immediate effect was that the Topeka Board of Education had to integrate its schools. So there always has to be like, like if controversy like has, to have an in, has to have an immediate effect. Nice. Um, and then uh, Alida, do you know the difference between mootness and ripeness? Um, yeah, uh, mootness is once like you bring a, a case to court, but it becomes a gets resolved prior to it actually being heard. So then it becomes moot. Um, and ripeness is when it's too early for it to be heard. Like there's no actual issue that can be heard because you're bringing it to ahead of time. Perfect. I like that. <clears throat> um, Matt, I love this, but you're answering this. Hard question. Where in the Constitution can the above requirements for justiciability be found? They're not in the Constitution. Okay. Nice. They're kind of like, they're right into uh, Article 3, but like they're not actually there. Right. That's what I was saying earlier in class, that it's all about interpretation what this con law is. I feel like you really were a good con law student in your career. So I'm Yeah, those are my favorite subjects. Definitely more than property or other ones. Nice. I like property, man, but... Constitution is, is it all you and you're here. So uh, Pablo, if possible, um, what are the powers of the executive branches in general and the president more specifically, both domestic and foreign? You don't have to say that's, that, that, that's question six, right? Yeah, question number six. Oh, I can zoom in on this one. Question uh, six. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. So what is the power of the executive branch in general and the president? Okay, yeah. Um, okay, related to the, I know to the president more, more specifically related is to the, um, what's the power of the executive branch? Veto is one. I guess. Veto power, yeah. You could say one and move to an, a friend, that's fair enough. The veto power. Does the president have a, can the president pocket veto? What is the question? Can the president do a pocket veto? No. Do you hear me? Yeah, you said no, right? Yeah, uh, but uh, so uh, so the the um, the power of the of the president he says uh, uh, be the um, be I'm not clear now about the the answer uh, veto. So yeah, um, they can veto. They can pardon. Um, yeah, he 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 can he can uh, he's uh, the commander in chief. He can, um, like uh, he's the 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 the, the um, oh my god, commander in chief. Veto pardon. Foreign affairs, uh, I think. Huh? Foreign affairs. Yeah, the executive branch is the exclusive uh, uh, representative of the United States in foreign affairs. And the president has the treaty power, right? Remember that little acronym we did, VETS, CAPS? Um, appointment powers, removal powers, things like that. Yeah, the, so the, the president, Andrew, I guess, uh, he cannot declare war, but he's, he's the commander in chief in related to that. Yeah. And, uh, and he's uh, uh, he negotiating uh, with the foreign. Uh, in charge of foreign affairs, yeah. Is there anything you want to add, Matt, about this question, the executive powers of the executive branch in general and the president more specifically? Um, well, the president can do a pocket veto, veto, which is just when Congress is out of session, but it's they're still waiting on the president to sign a bill. He can just refuse to sign, or she can just refuse to sign it. And then right, I wanted, to, I wanted to clarify that. The president of yeah. the United States can do a pocket veto. State governors usually cannot like florida you cannot do a pocket veto and um the president can and a pocket veto is when they just don't veto it and then it just you know goes on and it's essentially vetoed because they didn't sign it um anything else that you wanted to add with um, yeah i guess the president technically cannot declare war congress does but the president can you know bomb other places without a declaration of war so 
right kind of you know on paper versus in practice mm -hmm. and remember the appointment the removal and the pardoning powers these are absolute powers these are powers that the, they can't uh they, they can't change and it's federal pardon power it's not a state crime it's a federal crime okay bicameralism that's gotta be my favorite word is the requirement that the house and senate must act with one voice thank you for defining that however the constitution sets out four specific instances in which the bodies can act alone one instance for the house and three for the senate what are they i'll leave this one all the way open to the floor unless matt wants to answer after a moment of silence oh i mean i can I figure like I'll answer, we'll try on the stone those and then I can just say. Yeah. The okay, question I, I, I can just say on the someone knows. Um, so the house impeaches the president or other officials. They, they're the only ones who impeaches. The Senate doesn't impeach. And the Senate does the trial after the impeachment. That's two. Uh, the Senate is involved with treaties. That's three. And then the Senate's also involved with appointments of officials. That's four. Okay, good. And again, Matt and I are gonna have an answer sheet for all these things. Today is just like running through, seeing what we know and what we don't know. And the reason why I love this, like I said, Matt had one of the highest scores in the country on the MBE. And I told him to create something that comes from your brain that we can put into all of your brains. And this is really, really good. Um, all right, what restrictions, if any, are there on the president's appointment power? on the president's removal power. How can Congress regulate it? I mean, I saw, I thought it was absolute, but is there anything you want to add to that, Matt? Um, yeah, so Congress can uh, restrict president's removal power by, uh, so now, so actually I think the Supreme Court two years ago really like limited Congress's power to do that. But if it's like a multi-member board or, um, like an inferior officer with yeah. like independent that's how it comes like up on the president MBE. It's what, inferior, that's how it comes up on the mbe it's inferior yeah. officers, right where if it's an inferior officer it's not like a member of the cabinet or something like that then they have some uh authority but it's for superior officers it's absolute but yeah that yeah no. well if it's a, so independent counsel like investigating the president uh, Congress can put like four cause removal on that, or if it's like a multi-member nonpartisan board, like the FEC or SEC or any of those organizations. Good, good. Um, all right. Over what types of cases does the Supreme Court have original jurisdiction and appellate jurisdiction? Does anyone out there know? Original jurisdiction by the Supreme Court? I think original involves like cases involving ministers and like foreign ambassadors. And where the state is a party. Mm -hmm. Where states are a party or between foreign countries or um, admiralty. Uh, anything else, Matt? Um, let me see. It's, it's in Article 3. Uh, it's Article 3, Section 2. I'll find this. Give me a second. No, you're good. Um, and then... A Pelliger. Okay, so it's sorry. Uh, cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, or consuls. Case of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction. Controversies to which the United States shall be a party. The controversies between two or more states. Right. Yeah, that's exactly. I mean, I think we missed one, but pretty much we nailed it. And then appellate jurisdiction. Um, it's. Can you explain this? Because I, I I'd love to know more about this. But it's a three panel. Uh, review, right? There's rare cases where they do have a appellate jurisdiction over a three panel judge. Uh, oh, so there, yeah, there are cases where district court judges, I mean, I don't think this is really done anymore, but there's some cases where like three district court judges enter into a panel and then th that whatever their decision is goes right to the Supreme Court. And I only know like one instance, which was in California, or this is still federal, but they decided to like limit California's prison population and basically told California to like or at least 20% of all its prisoners. But that just kind of goes into that Congress can pass a law saying for prison cases, um, appellate, the circuit courts no longer have any jurisdiction, just goes from district to federal to Supreme Court. Or they could say this certain case only goes to appellate circuit and then to Supreme Court. So Congress has full power over Supreme Court appellate jurisdiction 
or any federal court appellate jurisdiction. Right. And um, cases can come to the Supreme Court via writ of certiorari. Yeah. Okay. What is judicial review and why is it important? What do you mean by that? Oh, so like just someone, like just what is judicial review? What would you, how would you answer that? Um, well, it's the power of the Supreme Court to like not only interpret laws and statutes, but say that this law conflicts with the constitution and just get rid of the law and say like, it's no longer valid. Like not every country has that. Sure, very important. Um, can Congress prevent the court from hearing certain type, kinds of cases? Yeah. Which kinds of cases? Any that it wants to. Sweet. When when can Congress delegate its power to other branches? So that, yeah, so you have something called the non-delegation doctrine, which is that Congress needs intelligible principles to, in order to delegate its power, like when it, you know, to certain like agencies in the federal government or like to certain judges, there needs to be like, an understandable standard that the non-Congress people can use to like carry out Congress's will. I think the Supreme Court will probably change this in the next year or so, but right now that's what it is. Okay. And lastly, I'm keeping you on the spot, man, because this is the hardest part of this little outline. Even for me, I want nothing to do with it. When may the Supreme Court hear cases appealed from state courts? Yeah, so that goes with independent and adequate, adequate state grounds when there when you lack an independent or adequate state ground so it's based on federal law or it's based on a state law that's identical to federal law or it's based on a state law that in some way like violates federal due process so it's not adequate nice man i gotta say these are good questions like these are digging deep you know the we used to say that the bar exam is a mile wide and six inches deep but i've come to realize it's a little bit deeper than that and and it's really great to have Matt, someone who is such a high scorer, you know, give us questions and things to think about and know that are even deeper. But maybe we can uh, jump back into some questions that we are solid with. How about, uh, M? are you actually, yeah, M? are you there? I'm here. Okay, what is the Commerce Clause? Uh, the Commerce Clause involves, <clears throat> like anything, Congress can really control in terms of things in their market, like marketable, I don't know, items, goods that are just in the stream of commerce, like, includes like so many things, like everything. Let's remember the three things, right? They can regulate the... Persons. Channels. Persons, channels and instrumentalities. Instrumentalities. And, and the persons. Economic activities that in the aggregate have an effect on their state commerce. All of that. <laughs> All of that. And, and we're still on the line. What's the dormant commerce clause? Uh, whatever the state does cannot interfere with the Commerce Clause. Fair enough. Yeah, they can't substantially burden interstate commerce. Um, is it found in the text of the Constitution? I want to say no, because nothing's found in the text of the Constitution. Is that right, Matt? But whenever that's a question, the answer is always no, usually. Yeah, nice. Um, and last question, and what is the scope of Congress's power to tax and spend? They can do all of it. They have the plenary power to tax and spend. Under they just don't have... They just don't have um, like police powers under Congress, but they can definitely tax and spend. And you were mad at me because when we first did con law, when we were studying together, my first question was, what are the first, you know, 16 amendments of the Constitution? And you were not happy with that. But now if I were to ask you, what amendment gives Congress the power to tax and spend, what would you answer? I still would not know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone help her? Like 15 or 16? 16, 16, yeah. 16. It's literally question 16. Wow. Think, let's that. think about the last one. On the list, the last one. The last one on my list. All right. Yeah, I won't forget that next time. Um, necessary and proper. Uh, and what, actually, one more. What, how would you explain that? It's kind of tough, but. How would I? It has to be one of the enumerated powers, it has to be connected to that. It's not usually an answer on the MBE. You're not, I really don't see this answer ever. It's usually taxing and spending. It's usually commerce clause, something like that. What are Congress's other important powers? 
Uh, we might have covered all of them, just like in the Krim Guide and the lecture and talking. No, we did, but I want to know what they are right now. Um, how about uh, Petey? Are you with us? Yo, I just I just drew a blank when, when you said that. No, but stay on the line because I'm going to ask you some other questions soon. But um, right. we're just talking about uh, other important powers. I think like um, declare war, commerce clause. Uh, talked about. Queen, they have like a federal land power. Police power over federal lands, like it was. General welfare. Yeah. Um, it was literally right here. Taxing and spending powers under the Commerce Clause, one related powers, investigatory power, property power, bankruptcy power, postal power, shrimp on the barbecue, <laughs> admiralty power, power to coin and fix uh, weights and measures. I was talking to my brother how I make references to movies that no one in the new generation has ever seen. But you guys have all seen Forrest Gump. That's it. Come on. Okay, so any whom, uh, which amendments does any, does Congress have the power to enforce? Uh, Tell me the answer is none of them. Oh, it's actually the 14th Amendment. Oh, right, the 14th Amendment. Yeah. Well, that's like kind of true. Yeah, it's a true question. Fair enough. What are the 10th and 11th Amendments? How they empower the states? Ooh, Petey, do you think you can tell me the 10th and 11th Amendments? Um... These are tough questions. I'm not trying to put you on the super spot. The 10th is, oh, shit. I still gotta memorize them. I only know certain ones. All right. Um, can anyone help him? Tenth Amendment. Don't worry, Pete. Barely anyone can help you. It's a hard question. Isn't the tenth the power to states, and eleventh is like that states have sovereign immunity? Yeah. Tenth. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Tenth is gonna be um, state sovereignty, whereas eleventh is gonna be sovereign immunity. 10th is preemption, federalism. 11th is sovereign immunity. You can't really sue the state unless they consent or some of these other conditions. Tough questions. 10th and 11th. Um, what is the loophole to getting around the 11th Amendment? Yeah, hint. sorry, I, that hint's probably not very helpful. That's just the name of the case, but. It's helpful to you. Yeah. What is, what, so what is the loophole to getting around the 11th Amendment? Yeah, you have to sue a state officer. You can't right. sue Georgia, but you could sue the Attorney General of Georgia. For an injunction that just happens to affect the state of Georgia. You could sue Herschel Walker. Um, no, he lost that. Um, what is the doctrine of incorporation? Have all amendments been incorporated against the states? Matt, you're back on the hook. Yes. Yeah, so, so after the 14th Amendment, uh, the Supreme Court started saying, actually, states have to apply the First Amendment. States have to apply the Second Amendment. States have to apply the Fifth Amendment. States have to apply the Eighth Amendment. But so I think the only one that haven't is the Seventh Amendment at this point. So some states, like they don't have to guarantee a jury trial for all civil cases. Right, and those questions are tough. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is state action? Why does classification matter? When can actually private party be considered state action? Um, well, if if it's intertwined by the private party, that would yeah. be intertwinement. Yeah, state action. That's like a high standard. Like if a like if a country club gets. 80% or gets like a state subsidy or like 80% state funding. I don't know why, but like if it did and it, you know, excluded women or different groups, like that wouldn't necessarily be state action. It has to be like very, very. Cool. Um, all right. In the interest of time, let's go through these rather quickly, but thoroughly, quickly and thoroughly. That's like nature of my game. Um, what is federal preemption? What are the types? And if so, what are they? What are the different types, Matt, of federal preemption? So there's conflict preemption when, so first of all, preemption is like the supremacy clause when state and federal law conflict. If the state law conflicts, then it's preempted. If the state law just interferes generally with the federal law, then it's not allowed. And if they're like the federal law, like takes over the field in that, like, I think like healthcare devices. So states can't pass laws about healthcare devices just because like the federal government's like, no, that's us, we're doing that. Right, like, bank or, like the federal law says state laws can't do this. Nice. Um, a taking, we talked about this. Um, there's possessory versus regulatory takings. Um, eminent domain is the taking of private property by a uh, public entity. There's always be just compensation. Regulatory is when 
it's like an act or ordinance that um, subject to the Penn Central multi-factor balancing test, the key is the investment back expectations. But there's other factors to consider in that. So look for that. Does anyone, uh, let's see, Mark, are you there? Yes, sir. Do you know what uh, amendment takings clause comes from? Uh, Fifth Amendment, right? That's correct. All right. Um, what are two instances of per se regulatory takings? No balance test needed. Matt, I'm going to need to phone a friend on this one. Okay, so the first is when, uh, going back investment back expectations, like if a regulation, like you buy like a piece of worthless beach on, and you want to build a house, and the state says, oh, actually, you can't build houses on this beach, and there's no other use for the beach other than building homes, like that's a complete destruction of your economic investment. Mm -hmm. So it has to be like, a, when it's like 100%, like anything, your land is no longer economically valuable because of the regulation, there's no balancing test. It's just a taking. Or if it's like they put a stop sign in your yard where they put like electrical, like wiring under the yard, like right. any like physical intrusion. Or physical intrusion. Right. Yeah. Perfect. Ooh, can you explain this to the class, an exaction? Yeah, so an exaction is basically when you have to pay money or like they condition. So they say, oh, you can build a house on this property, but you also have to uh, put solar panels on it or you have to uh, build a bike path. And that's like, the, so whatever, so now the test is that the exaction has to be reasonable and proportionate to like whatever the law is that they're asking. It's kind of confusing. I don't think it's going to be in the bar, but just Fair enough. good to know what exaction is. Um, yeah. Taking if it's if it's sufficient, if it's uh, uh, material, and it amounts to some deprivation of your property rights. Um, speech and debate clause. You're going to be protected for your legislative acts, whether you defame someone or something like that, and also your assistance will also be protected under the speech and debate clause, but only federal legislation, not for state legislation. Full faith and credit, Georgia is going to recognize the judgments of Florida, right? We're going to recognize the judgment from other states. Um, the five guarantees of the First Amendment, I've never seen it written out like that. Do you know what they are, Matt? Oh, uh, just free speech, religion, assembly, press, uh, petition. On the petition. Nice. Yeah. Did you get that? Religion, assembly, wait, religion, speech, press, assembly, petition. Perfect. Rational basis, intermediate scrutiny, and strict scrutiny. Um, who may, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? I can hear perfectly. Can you tell the class the difference between rational basis, intermediate scrutiny, and strict scrutiny? Yeah, so rational basis, the standard is uh, that the government action is rationally related to a legitimate state interest. Um, the 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 burden is on the person bringing the action mm -hmm. um and it applies to it's kind of the default so if nothing if if intermediate scrutiny and strict scrutiny don't apply then then you use that um so intermediate scrutiny is the standard is um substantially related to an Im important government interest yep. um the burdens on the state to prove that and that goes for gender um that is that it? it or maybe alienage too illegitimacy illegitimacy okay and then strict scrutiny is um necessary um to further a, co a compelling government interest the burden's also on the state and that's for uh like protected classes like race um age ethnicity things like that race alienage national origin yeah fundamental rights um age would be a rational basis but i know you okay know, i know you know that but um all right matt that was a really really good job make sure everyone knows the difference between them you'll get a lot of points you did great with that may um matt what is this rational basis with bite yeah so like you said like everything's kind of like whatever the judges want so there are some cases like with gay rights or mental disabilities or um, the children of immigrants where it's technically rational basis, but they'll still apply stricter scrutiny. 
I get that. It's rational yeah. basis that will yeah. apply stricter screening in certain circumstances. It's good to know some vocab words. Okay. What is speech? Is speech just words in writing or can symbols and conduct be speech? Certainly symbols and conduct can be speech. Right? I think we all understand that. Um, what are the differences between content-based and content-neutral restrictions on speech? We, we talked about this a lot today. Content-based strict scrutiny. Content-neutral, the time, place, and manner. And then it's going to depend if it's a public forum or a non-public forum. If it's a public forum, then it's going to be some intermediate scrutiny that leaves alternative means of communication. If it's a non-public forum or limited use forum, then, well, if it's a designated public forum, I mean, if it's a public forum and it's content neutral, then it would be uh, um, time, place, and manner, like we said. If it's only a uh, non-public forum, then it just needs to be viewpoint neutral. These are these are tough questions that this afternoon I'm sure we're going to encounter content based and content neutral restrictions. Time, place, and manner we just talked about. It's not where it is. It's not what's being said. It's where it's being said, and and you can regulate that to a certain extent. Uh, forums, you know, like a gymnasium is an example of a forum. There's public forums. There's non-public forums. There's designated public forums that are like being used only for this particular space what type of locations has the supreme court found to be private forums mm, what you were thinking matt when you wrote that um i was thinking uh i want to say military bases prisons uh things of that nature it's just a very like there's no like really like oh this is obviously a private forum you just kind of have to know like what the supreme court has said yeah all right and i wanted to give it a student who i didn't call this morning the opportunity lucas are you there It's not going to be a tough one. Um, Claudio, are you there? There I am. It just wouldn't have muted itself. So. No worries, Lucas. All right. What categories of speech are not protected under the First Amendment? Categories of speech not protected under the First Amendment? Uh, I think I just read this one the other day, too. And we're almost finished with class. We might just go a few minutes over today. Just bear with us. I want to get through this sheet, but it's almost done. I'm blanking on it right now. All right, Claudio, are you with us? Yeah. Do you know what categories of speech are not protected under the First Amendment? Fighting words, incitement of imminent, un un uh, imminent unlawful activity, uh, oh. misleading um, information, uh, yeah. obscenity. Misleading commercial speech. Yeah. yeah. Misleading, yeah. Or potentially defamation. Um, yeah. And then oh, also um, obscenity. Obscenity, yeah. What makes speech obscene? If it appeals to the prurient interest and it has no artistic appeal? Yeah. Yeah, like no artistic, social, scientific, literary, or like whatever value. And that's kind of tough. Like most things do have some scientific liter. Like that's right. Pornography, isn't that the argument that it's actually art? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when is commercial speech protected? Usually, right? If it's not false or misleading. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you got me on this one. What's the uh, same? That's just like, that was the case that kind of like laid out uh, the standard for defamation of a public figure. Okay. Yeah. And defamation comes up and you know that there's a heightened standard if they are a public figure, for sure. Prior restraints are usually held invalid, like a gag order, right? That you're you're not allowed to say something before you've even said it. Um, what speech rights do public school students have? Government employees. What do you think, Matt? Uh, public school students, they have some free speech, but it can't be like up to the point that it starts disrupting the, the teaching process, like education. So also on field trips, uh, you're still subject to those restrictions. There's those kids in Alaska who like went on a field trip. They hung up this poster that said bong hits for Jesus. They got in trouble. Went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, no, they're actually on a field trip. You're still unprotected. But then, like, I think this last year, this cheerleader who, like, cursed out her teammates on Snapchat or, like, TikTok or something, oh, Supreme yeah. Court said that was okay and that that was protected. Right, because she was on Snapchat. She was outside the field of the soccer team. But when you're on the field trip, you can have the bong hits for Jesus. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about government employees? Kind of similar yeah so 
they have no rights when, well, they have some rights, but they have no speech rights when they're acting in their public capacities because you can't just have your employee like completely disagreeing with what you're doing. But if they're speaking in their personal capacity on a subject of public interest, then they have their own free speech rights. Right, like there's the one question where the girl was allowed to say that she didn't support the mayor, even though she worked for the mayor. It wasn't okay to fire her just because it was her statement that she wasn't, like she didn't vote for him or something. Yeah, well, if she was like in her office, like as a receptionist and someone called, like that's in being in her public position, she's like, oh no, the mayor's not gonna help you, he's terrible. You could get fired for that. She's Just, like, that's as an employee saying that. All right, one Daddy. thing about, go ahead. Right. Um, I think that when it has to do with your job, um, it is it's not protected. Like yeah, you exactly. Have exactly. To, they, mm -hmm. exactly. Right. If it's necess necessary for your job, you know, one thing about me is I always like to finish on time. I'm respectful of people's time, but we spent a few extra minutes this morning, you know, reviewing. So let's try and just finish up quickly. I appreciate your patience, and we'll just finish up these last ones. Uh, what are the religious freedom guarantees of the First Amendment? Freedom of exercise and freedom of establishment. And it's going to be that sincerely held belief. Um, yep. What is the significance of Employment Division v. Smith? I would ask Matt. Uh, that's that, uh, like laws that affect religion, like neutrally, like a ban on like hats. Oh, that affects, you know, yarmulkes, hijabs, all that. If that's like done in a neutral way, then it's a rational basis. Right. I like that. Uh, freedom of assembly, a petition of the press. These are First Amendment uh, protected things. We understand what they mean. What does vagueness and overbreath mean? Um, we talked about that. Vague, you don't know what's being punished. Overbreath, it's punishing too much. Can you have a law that is only vague but not overbroad and vice versa? I would say so. Is the yeah. answer no, The answer is yes. What is procedural due process? Talking about notice and hearing. What is sorry, the. I'm sorry for saying so many cases that I realized. I didn't realize it did that. Well. We're trying to get like you. We're trying to emulate greatness. What is the Matthews v. Eldridge balancing test? Yeah, so that you're balancing um like the government like interest versus the private personal interest in having their rights, and then like against the cost of uh like instituting like extra procedures like oh like going before a judge and like saying I don't want my benefits getting taken away. So it's okay access to courts and things like that. No, no, no. It's like. Or we, I can talk about it later. But it's like if someone's getting their welfare benefits taken away, like include like more procedures would be like letting them go before like a tribunal or like calling witnesses, stuff like that. Okay, I get it. So it's a balancing test to determine yeah. if additional procedures uh, are constitutionally valid or not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, the difference between substance due process, equal protection. We've hammered this home. Equal protection is when a specific group is being targeted. For substance due process is when everyone's rights are being violated. Different, different suspect classifications. Um, we talked about race, alienage, national origin. Um, those are the three suspect classifications on, on the MBE, right? And then fundamental rights, we talked about camper, contraception, abortion, marriage, uh, parental rights, I'm sorry, procreation, right to educate your children and family relation. The abortion one's kind of skeptical. There was uh, fundamental rights were right to travel, right to vote, right to, uh, anything else I'm missing? Access to courts. Access to courts, yeah. Some good fundamental rights. And then finally, without, uh, last, I guess that I list, oh, I did. Um, do you think there's a difference between the rights found in each clause? Okay, cool. So- I don't know, I don't, I don't know if there's an answer to that. Yeah, no, I like these. I like the way your mind works, Matt. You're really someone who, what I admire about you is you're interested in the material. And that's something that, yeah, that definitely can, helps. That's something that everyone can learn from, you know, like for better or for worse, you have to take this exam that's coming up and you have to master the material. If you look at it with a positive mindset and are interested in it, you know, that's gonna serve you well. Matt really cares about this. He wants to talk about this. It's, it's fun to him. So, you know, you can reach out to me, reach out to him, reach out to us. We're here to help. I hope today was valuable. We're going to come back at four o'clock and do MBE questions. And I think of all this uh, 12 hours of teaching I do on Saturdays and Sundays. My favorite part and my students' favorite part is this afternoon doing the live MBE questions. So looking forward to seeing everyone this afternoon. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. We definitely appreciated your presence here. You're 
a master of the Constitution for sure. Um, thank you all.